All right, welcome back everyone to Act 3. Uh, to borrow a phrase from Karin, this is the nutrients, 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 all we ever seem to talk about session. Um, so the, the Bay, as you all know, has highly elevated nutrient concentrations. Um, we know from Jim Clone's work and, and the rest of his team that the Bay has a certain resilience or resistance to the, those nutri high nutrient concentrations having an adverse impact in the Bay, but the long-term record from that program as well has shown us that that resistance has changed over time. And that's one of the key things that really spurred on the regional community into beginning to explore this. Um, the RMP played a major role in launching this nutrient effort by funding early projects, and, and the program has grown substantially since that first, those first projects back in 2011, 2012. The, the growth of that program comes to borrow from another phrase, comes from, um, from Steve, that forward-thinking dischargers who see their job as protecting water quality in the Bay, working with forward-thinking regulators who want the best possible science to inform their decisions. Um, and we've grown this nutrient management strategy into a program that is aiming to address a couple of simple-sounding but ambitious questions. One is, does the Bay Currently, nutrients cause adverse impacts in the Bay, or might they under future, some of the future scenarios that we were discussing earlier? Um, and the second major question is, if, if there are problems or, or major risks of problems, what, what are the necessary management actions that would actually keep the Bay safe? Um, the, to get to those answers, we work with a, a, a great regional research community, and we also, what I used to refer to as a, uh, I used to refer to it as we have a small nimble team that I might borrow again from Carl. I, I like her phrase that it's a small mighty team. Um, and the three of those mighty people are going to be presenting today. Um, come, first up is Rusty Holloman, our hydrodynamic and biogeochemical modeler is going to summarize recent progress on that front. Rusty. All right, welcome back from lunch. Uh, yeah, let's jump right into the, the modeling. I'm going to be talking about various things we've been doing on the hydrodynamic and biogeochemical modeling in the last year. And I just want to acknowledge the other co-authors on this work, uh, Emma Nuss and Jen Ling Zhang, as well as uh, Dave Sen and his guidance of the NMS program at SFBI overall. So, modeling. Like, why, why do we bother with modeling? You know, we talk a lot about collecting data, observations, and of course, I mean, the observations have to be the starting point, and they're just invaluable in understanding the system. But they are limited. They're limited in where we can take them, when we can take them, uh, and they're very much limited in only looking at conditions which have already existed. That we can't take observations in the future. And a lot of times we want to know not just what are the conditions, but, but why. And we want to understand the processes behind these conditions. And you know, why is the chlorophyll high or the DO low? And models are that way of bringing together observed data, our understanding of the processes, and synthesizing those together in models, which then enable complex predictions. And not just predictions, but also give us a chance to you kind of look under the hood and understand why is a certain outcome the way that it is. But I want to point out that these models do get complex and you know, we try to add more and more into them. And every one of these pieces is an opportunity to make either a wrong turn or a weak assumption. And so it takes a lot of care to really make sure that each of these pieces is doing what we think it's doing for the right reasons. And along those lines, the things I'm going to talk about today are sort of zooming in on a few of those pieces and trying to understand how they work, getting them to work better, and talking about our path towards building up these complex models. So I'm going to break this into three parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about some of our modeling at the full base scale, which is stuff that we've had going on for the, the longest. Then I'm going to talk about a newer project where we're doing some hydrodynamic modeling in lower South Bay and zooming in on smaller scales. And then finally, a project where we're a little more forward-looking and trying to look at, well, what's going to happen in the future and what should we be thinking about with that forward view? So on the full-day modeling, I'm just going to jump right in here with an animation 
Right, I don't have dramatic uh, you know, horror stories or, or victories from the field like, uh, like Alicia was showing, but we can make animations. So, right, so you're probably wondering what in the world are we looking at? Uh, geographically, this is a perspective view. Uh, this is kind of the South Bay here. This is the San Francisco shoreline. This is Treasure Island, uh, Alameda. Um, and these rubber band looking things, these are showing the contours around freshwater sources. So this is a, a test of the updated model showing how we introduce freshwater into various parts of the bay and how that gets wafted around and mixed by the tides. So some of the updates to this hydrodynamic model. Well, there's been a big change in the underlying platform that we're working with. We've shifted to a platform called Deltaris Flow Flexible Mesh. Uh, technical details maybe are less important, but it's a model that we've already We've always planned on using, but it took um, some development before we could get to this point. And so we had to sort of use some other models for a little while, and now we're transitioning to this model. Uh, overall, it's more actively developed. It's a more flexible model, has a bigger user community. It allows us to represent these sources in a more accurate way, so like bringing in the discharges in a more precise way. We've also used this as a chance to uh, work with Jing Wu to uh, calibrate and develop a hydrologic model so that now all the, the stormwater sources coming into the, the model are actually coming from her calibrated hydrologic model, which seems like it's made a, a lot of improvements in our ability to represent the salt field. So, I mean, the, the animations are, are fun and all, but of course, you know, we have to be responsible and, and look at, well, how does the model actually perform? How well can it reproduce the conditions that are observed? So, one of the things that we look at is, uh, is the velocity record. This is uh, data taken from a point in the, the channel of South Bay, kind of near Redwood City. The uh, model we were using previously, you can see in this kind of scatter plot, uh, it, it did fairly well, but in this particular site, there were a lot of places where it departed from that kind of perfect one-to-one -one line. And uh, for several different reasons, this new model is doing a lot better in those kinds of, of situations. So we, we feel like we've made some solid improvements on the hydrodynamic uh, abilities on the velocity. Similarly, on salinity, and of course, exactly as Jim mentioned earlier, every hydrodynamic model which is attempted to be calibrated in the bay, you're required, they make you sign this when you get hired, to, to make a plot like this that shows the USGS transect data, salinity, this is uh, South Bay moving on up to Rio Vista. This is the observed data. The, the vertical axis here is depth. And this is the model output. And I feel like, I mean, this is, Jay asked me, well, did, did I cherry pick this particular plot? Because I'm i pretty proud of this one. <laughs> um, but I, I did not. This is, this is a fairly typical. It's definitely not the worst. It's not the best. But uh, this is, pretty indicative of how the model is doing. So I feel like we're, we're really looking pretty good on that front. So that's hydrodynamics. And of course, I mean, this is the, the nutrient modeling effort. And so you know, we really need to, you know, the, the hydrodynamics are just the starting point. And early on, I think a lot of people have probably seen one version or another of this kind of plot. Uh, this is sort of our first foray into the nutrient modeling. So we're taking those hydrodynamics plumbing in nutrient loads, in this case, really focusing on dissolved inorganic nitrogen. So ammonium and nitrate coming in from about 40 dischargers, putting that into the model. And then we have just the simplest of nutrient cycling where uh, those, those nutrients undergo nitrification and denitrification. And we come up with these spatial plots that you know, we can look at sort of spatial patterns and seasonal patterns. and I guess I was a little surprised at how well these did, but they, they definitely miss a lot of the temporal patterns. And, and clearly, biogeochemistry in the bay is a lot more complicated than those four boxes would, uh, would entail. And so one of the big things that we've been working on recently, and this is stuff that Jinling Zhang has been working on, uh, is, is adding more complexity into this model, and in particular, adding in phytoplankton. So if we take this really simplified model, well, kind of one step up is to add in phytoplankton as a, a, a sink for nutrients. So uptake 
of those uh, of, of the nitrogen by the phytoplankton. And the problem is that if we uh, run that model, well, it actually got really, really worse, the, uh, the quality, the skill of the model. So here I'm showing a model that would just use those set of processes. Uh, in the upper panel, I'm showing DIN, so the, the nitrogen. Lower panel is phytoplankton biomass. And again, and you'll notice that the dots, which are nowhere close to the solid line, are the observations. And so with just this set of, uh, this kind of complexity, well, we ended up with, with a system that didn't really correspond to reality at all. You know, DIN is way too low, phytoplankton way too high. You, know, you see all these dots lined up almost on the bottom axis. And so clearly, you know, we need a little bit more. And that little bit more, which is really just a step along the path to a whole lot more, is, is to add not just phytoplankton, but also the zooplankton and other, uh, uh, other organisms who, that feed on the phytoplankton. And so, if we're kind of like looking at this flow chart, then that means basically that the phytoplankton then can be consumed by, you know, one sort of grazer or another. And so it's, you know, we need that interaction between the phytoplankton and the grazers. And now, again, nitrogen on top, phytoplankton on the bottom, and this is a, is a, a sort of test case centered around a bloom in Lower South Bay in 2013. And Genlink and was able to properly encode these, these kinds of consumption behaviors and, and reproduce that sort of bloom. And so you see now that phytoplankton biomass, you know, it's, it's nice and low before the bloom, really big bloom spike up to there. But then the combination of, of grazers and nutrient limitation are able to bring that back down and get us back down to these baseline levels. And now we're, we're tracking both the phytoplankton and I'm plotting in blue now the, the zooplankton. And this doesn't look exactly like a plot that Jim showed earlier, but that, that idea of the zooplankton being a control on phytoplankton and their population dynamically responding to the phytoplankton population uh, it is a really important part and something that we have to get into the models in order for them to really have any skill. So now I'm going to sort of switch the graphic focus and, uh, and really zoom in on this Lower South Bay modeling project. This is a, a younger effort, but it's, a, it's pretty exciting and it's a lot of fun to kind of get into these smaller scales. Uh, the, the first step, or I should say the sort of the, the background of the Lower South Bay modeling effort, is really to look at, at that interaction between the margins and the open bay. You know, in the Lower South Bay is just a fascinating geometry, this interconnected network of sloughs and ponds and you know, levees that have breaches or they have flow control structures. You know, not to mention that the open bay down there, you know, is home to three separate dischargers as well as just it's it hydrodynamically, it's a, um, like a long residence time area. So all these things come together to make it a, a pretty interesting place to, to try to model with a lot of, of interesting questions. So we want to know, understand that interaction between the margins in the bay. And also things like what Karin alluded to earlier, understanding if we do things like recycle more water, what does that do to water quality and the flushing of, of these areas? And are those concerns that we need to, to think about before you know, making large decisions? So in terms of where we are on this project, well, the first step was to make sure that we had an adequate representation just of the geometry of, of these really small scale features, you know, getting down to, to five and 10 meter type features. So that was uh, what led to the generation of this uh, 3D model that really covers at a, a fine scale the geometry and the elevations in Lower South Bay, with a lot of attention to making sure that you know, those, if there was a breach in the real levee, well then you know, our elevation model has to have that breach also. And if a levee is continuous, well then we can't have an artificial hole in the model that, uh, that would let flow through artificially. With that in hand, then uh, of course there's a, a grid generation where we kind of develop some of the geometries for the computational model inputs. That was uh, work that we really drew heavily on a collaboration with RMA on. 
And where we are now is that we're let's say like fairly well along in, in the calibration of this hydrodynamic model. So I'm going to show tides and a little bit of salinity on the, the next slide. This is a, a comparison of observed tides in the black. And these are observations that are coming from SFBI's moored sensor network. So uh, a series of, of moorings that we're maintaining down in these, these uh, slough sites. Those are in black. And then the model predictions are in red. And so I'd say overall, I'm feeling pretty good about this. You know, there, there's some places where we're a little bit off, but considering that the tides enter the model out here, you know, basically at point rays. And the model is having to compute how those tides propagate through, you know, across Potato Patch Shoals, through the Golden Gate, down, you know, down through a Central Bay, South Bay, through the uh, Dumbarton, and finally winding their way, that tidal wave winding its way up the sloughs. And by the time it gets there, it's still pretty close to the observations. So again, I, I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good on the, the tidal side here. Salinity is a little, it's, it's, it's a rung or two up the ladder of, of difficulty in terms of getting good calibrations. And so it's a little bit more of a mixed bag right now. Uh, again, black is the observations from SFBI moorings. Uh, the red is the salinity from the model. In Coyote Creek, I feel like we're, we're doing pretty well. It's a little bit, it's not quite as in the margins as uh, some of the other sites. And you know, we're getting a good ranges and good shape here. Guadalupe Slough, man, Guadalupe Slough is a confusing place. <laughs> There's some weird stuff going on here. Like, look at these, these spikes that just like show up and then disappear. And it seems like it, it goes dry. And so the, the data sort of disappears. And when the water reappears, it's totally different water. There's these, these jumps. And so there's a lot going on here. We're capturing some of that. Some of that we think is, is actually related to, to gate operations. So we kind of took a, a closer look at what's going on at these spikes. And, and that seems like it's actually related to a gate. It's, it's the gate on pond A3W, which only I think opened something like a year and a half or so ago. Uh, so, so we have some clues on, on how to fix that. But yeah, it, it's a complicated area. So moving on from Lower South Bay, the last thing I'm going to talk about is some of our risk-based and, uh, and scenario modeling. What we're trying to answer here are these, these types of questions. And these are things that I feel like Steve Weisberg gave us a, a nice kind of um, intro to, to this kind of thinking. We know that conditions in the bay and, and external drivers are changing. And we should think about, well, how should we manage to anticipate those changes? and the possible negative impacts on the, uh, on the bay's water quality. So kind of conceptually, you could sort of drive, you can separate these drivers into things that we can't easily manage. You know, at least in the local scale, you know, we, we can't really locally turn back climate change. But there are things, say, like nutrient loads, that we can you know, make some kind of management decisions about. And there's certain combinations of these drivers which maybe yield a bay that has a very low risk of harmful algal blooms or low DO, but there are other combinations where, where that we, we may be at, at a significant risk. And if we're sort of, you know, again, in the schematic version, if we're sort of out here, well, as we look forward in time, we might be, we don't know yet, we might be progressing into a case where there's greater risk or less risk or kind of the same. And if we are, if we are headed towards this high risk, well, now is when we need to figure out what can we do to instead take a path maybe more like that and avoid those high risk situations? So this, there are a lot of factors that go in here. And at the end of the day, the things that we're focusing on in terms of kind of the end metrics are what's going on with phytoplankton and what's going on with dissolved oxygen. Well, those, I mean, there are a lot of drivers here, you know, what controls the phytoplankton, you know, nutrients, light, grazers, and we can kind of keep stacking on the complexity until we just have this inscrutable web. And so this is one of the steps where we really have to zoom in and think, well, what's, what's going on with one of these things? And let's think about one thing at a time. And so for a slide and a half, the one thing 
of time we're going to talk about is stratification and vertical mixing. So almost done. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and set this playing and, uh, and kind of walk through what's going on here. This is uh, some work that Emma has done trying to understand, well, what controls stratification? And we know that when there's persistent stratification for, say, multiple days or weeks, that, that those are conditions that can lead to a phytoplankton bloom. Typically, we don't get those conditions, but under certain combinations of freshwater inflows and deep tides, we, we can get those kinds of situations. And so this is a model showing, on the left, that salinity stratification and you can see as we move into the neap tides, you know, this surface layer where I'm showing uh, salt as a, a function of depth, this is the stratification and this is the, the set of conditions where the phytoplankton could really take off. And, and this would be a scenario in which we would say that there is some moderate risk of a bloom. So summary next steps. I don't think I have time to really walk through all of this stuff, but you know, hopefully this has sparked some questions that. Um, that maybe I can talk with people about afterwards. And uh, I should probably just wrap up and thank the funders and uh, also our science collaborators. Thanks. So Rusty's shout out to the Bears reminded me that I missed a key part of my moderator duties and I need to stick with that this time. So up next is Lisa McVeigh. Lisa joined us also from UC Berkeley with a PhD in civil and environmental engineering, I believe before that the University of Michigan. Okay. And does the and, and somewhere in between there or after a, a postdoc at USGS, does USGS have a mascot? No. Okay. So anyway, Lisa, Rusty's introduction was a great, um, a great entry here to Lisa's work, especially the complexity of Lower South Bay. And you're going to see through Lisa's presentation why getting that right is so important. Okay. Um, thank you guys for coming. And thanks to uh, the people that I've been working with um, at SFEI and elsewhere, but mainly Rusty, Zephyr Sylvester, and Dave. Um, looking at dissolved oxygen in Lower South Bay. The so Lower South Bay is not in that photo. Um, this is something I feel like we've we've talked about pretty thoroughly um, in in previous talks today. But you know, of course, we're we're really motivated by this mysterious characteristic of San Francisco Bay, this resiliency to nutrient enrichment, where we don't find ourselves having these um, really severe low oxygen or hypoxic events or at least not very often, and at least not yet. Um, and so we're interested in DO partly because it is part of this really complex puzzle involving um, phytoplankton and nutrients, but also because um, stressors don't really occur usually one at a time. So if we start seeing problems with DO, that could indicate that there are um, others that we should be learning about as well. Um, now you just heard Rusty talk about modeling San Francisco Bay, and you've you've followed Jim's research over the years and that of others, talking about collecting data um, using ship-based methods. And I'm going to be focusing on. Let's see which one is the actual. There we go. Um, measurements that we're taking uh, down in the in the Lower South Bay continuously high frequency, so every 15 minutes, measuring water quality at these stations shown in the red dots. That's going to be the focus of what I tell you about. I use the term observing, which makes it sound like we're sitting back you know, with popcorn. Um, and, and we're not. This is Zephyr Sylvester climbing. Um, I think this is the San Mateo Bridge Pier. Shira took the photo. She would know. She says, yes, it is San Mateo. Really, really physically demanding. I've had the honor of going out with them a handful of times, and, and I am tired at the end of the day. So not only physically, uh, our physics are, play a major role here. It's very interdisciplinary. We have a persistent and irritating presence of chemistry and biology. Um, you guys who have been out there, you know how much stuff grows on uh, something that looks inhospitable. Um, you also need a pretty unique skill set to succeed here. 
So this is um, this is a USGS uh, employee named Kurt, who who really spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, working extremely hard, um, getting some pretty awesome data. So after extending all of that energy, um, what starts to form are these really robust and detailed um, records of data from from our, our mooring network. So what I'm showing you now is chlorophyll on the left-hand axis and DO on the right-hand axis for Dumbarton Bridge. And this is at um, five different years. So broken out by, uh, by year 2013 at the top going down to 2017, the Dumbarton Bridge Station. And tons and tons of detail here. The point is not to go into every single aspect of what I'm showing you, but to just show you a few things. Like, for example, we can see that there's um, a seasonal pattern where we get low DO uh, consistently occurring in the summer and fall months. And then we get higher DO out in the spring and winter months, early spring and winter. Um, and then we have some uh, covariance with chlorophyll. So you'll see some of these events where chlorophyll increases, you'll see DO following it as well. And then they, they decline um, on similar time scales, sometimes with a lag. Um, you can see the strong tidal influence. So this is, you know, this is a year at a time in each of these panels. And these small oscillations are, are tidal. So really strong um, mechanism driving a lot of the dynamics tides here. OK, so I'm going to show you another station, Alviso Slough, but I'm going to keep the axes the same. So just look at this transition. A little different here. Um, the range of DO and chlorophyll at Alviso, which is down here, um, much, much, much greater. The range is a lot greater. The variability is a lot greater. Um, these sloughs are really, really fascinating areas. And I want to tell you this is during the time period of Alicia's adventures um, this winter. So she was standing down there in Guadalupe Slough <laughs> for some of this. And you'll see that this is a really anomalous winter for DO and chlorophyll in Alviso. And you know, we, we are hypothesizing that this is just entirely freshwater flow coming in, pushing out any marine phytoplankton um, constant DO level, compressing the variability here in this stretch. So there's a lot to unravel. OK, um, if we try to summarize DO condition based on these measurements in a spatial way, then, then this is one example of, of trying to do that. So I'm going to explain this symbol here. The light blue goes from 3 milligrams per liter of DO concentrated concentration up to 10. So the light blue always occupies that concentration space. And then the dark blue band um, shows the, the interquartile range, or the 25th to 75th percentile um, concentrations of DO at each of our monitoring or mooring stations. So down here in the sloughs, Coyote Creek, up to Dumbarton. And I think the, the most striking thing when looking at this map is the really strong spatial gradient in range of dissolved oxygen, starting from Dumbarton Bridge up here, where the range is, is very narrow. It's around 6 or 7 uh, milligrams per liter pretty consistently. And then you look at the extreme end, both in DO range as well as in space, which is the outlet of pond A8 and really large range and getting up to 10 milligrams per liter at the 75th percentile. So 25% of the time, it's greater than 10 milligrams per liter. So this is a, a, an indication, and I'll come back to this, of really strong primary product productivity um, going on in this pond, pond A8. And then you have the sloughs in between that are influenced by both of these end members. You know, you've got the tide flashing these water masses back and forth, and you're feeling the effects the kind of open bay scenario up here and the potentially pond impacted um, DO regime down here at the south. OK, so that's kind of a nice, nice snapshot of condition. But can we talk about mechanisms? And to talk about mechanisms in a, in a quantifiable way, we need some kind of framework. So I'm, I'm working in a very simplistic one-dimensional transport reaction equation that I'm showing here. 
And this equation represents a, a very simplified set of influences on dissolved oxygen. Um, we have the physical processes of advection and dispersion exchange uh, across the air-sea interface. Um, we have uh, phytoplankton that photosynthesizes and respires. Um, and then we have exchange and respiration within the sediment underlying the water column. And so those are represented by these terms. And we don't necessarily need to go into the details of this equation or the terms of this equation, but what we want to do is use it to create bins that we can uh, represent these processes with in a quantifiable way. So we just want to group some of these and then start putting numbers on them. Um, so our physical processes are here, advection and diffusion, shown in orange. And then we can kind of lump together everything else that's happening in a vertical slice of the water column um, with, with this term shown here on the right-hand side. Separating these is really, really tricky, however, when you want to start putting numbers on things. Um, so if you've seen this, this really nice paper by Nick Nadiko et al., they got over this problem by just building a dam. <laughs> you know, it's not something that we're considering to do. So um, I feel like our options are limited in this respect. So we had to use, you know, we had to use other means. And um, what we did was use our understanding of the tidal cycle to pick out particular moments in time where we could ignore physical transport. Okay, and, what, and we rely on the symmetry of the tides and a conservative scalar. And dissolved oxygen and attribute that to what's happening in the water column that's separate from physical transport processes. So please come talk to me if you want to hear more about this. I'm not going to go into the details of how we did it, although to me it's fascinating. So um, ask me about it if you're interested. Uh, the, the results of that calculation are what I'm showing up here in this top panel. So this is, this is Alviso Slu. This is uh, several years, uh, about four years shown here. And I'll explain what each of these panels contains. Up at the top, this is that, that flux. And let me point out from the previous slide, I do want to emphasize that we're calling this a net DO flux. It's the sum of all of these terms. And if it's greater than zero, then it's net production. And if it's less than zero, then it's net respiration. So it's important to keep in mind the sign. And so the results of that are up at the top. And again, I'm kind of showing a distribution. These are, these are monthly uh, median values shown in the black dot. And then that 25th to 75th percentile range is shown in the light gray around it for, for the month of those estimates. And then beneath that, we have DO, chlorophyll, salinity, and temperature, and these are daily averages of those quantities. So a little bit of the tidal influence, the diurnal tide is, is kind of smoothed over there. And one nice thing that came out of this comparison is you can see this alignment between these strongly negative net DO fluxes, so dominated by respiration or co consumption of oxygen, and then these, these really apparent seasonal declines in the concentration of dissolved oxygen that we were observing. So now these measurements of the flux in the top panel, they're used, um, they're calculated on data points that are minutes to maybe an hour apart. So these are fine scale in terms of time, but we're able to relate them to seasonal time scales in our observed DO. So, we have some encouragement that we are actually capturing one of these mechanisms in a way that is going to help us understand the system better. So let's take this calculation, this quantity, the net DO flux, and look at it on a map, the same way that we did with um, DO condition or measurements of dissolved oxygen. And I'm going to explain what this symbol is. It's a little more complicated now. It goes from negative 12 grams of oxygen per meter squared per day um, up to four grams per meter squared per day. So that's what the orange color occupies on each of those symbols. And then the range of that flux estimate is shown in dark red. And the white line that goes across each bar is always zero. So you can tell when it's uh, respiration or production dominated, or positive or negative. And we can, again, look at this pretty strong spatial gradient. Oh, and for reference, 
Um, estuarine respiration typically from the literature is somewhere in this near zero range. Now these are different quantities I want to point out. Respiration is, is just the one oxygen consuming quantity represented here, whereas this net DO flux encompasses all the things that are consuming and, and creating oxygen. So, so they're different, but nevertheless, it's a, an important scale to keep in mind. Okay, so if we look up at Dumbarton, the net DO flux is, you know, a lot like this kind of typical estuarine respiration value. Um, it's negative, but it's near zero. And then if you go way down here, particularly to pond A8 or to um, the Alviso complex, you've got very, very negative, strongly respiring um, DO fluxes. So, the, pardon me, the consumption of oxygen or the demand for oxygen down in that area is really, really high. Okay, we can go a little bit farther to uh, parsing some of the mechanisms that are represented inside of this box. The dark red line is the net DL flux. That's the sum of all of these. We can get a little closer to um, net metabolism by making an estimate of reaeration and then subtracting that from the total DO flux that we were calculating previously. And doing this at one station where we have wind speed and water velocity and kind of most of the uh, parameters that we need to make a nice estimate for reaeration, we get that it's about zero to two positive, so from atmosphere to water column, um, grams per meter squared per day. So, you know, we're looking at 10 to 20 percent of the total DO flux um, occupied by this uh, reaeration mechanism. But in any case, all of the, what this means is that each of those net DO flux numbers become even a little bit more negative, right? Once you subtract this zero to two uh, for reaeration. So what this is implying at Alviso SLU, which is where I'm giving you these um, numbers as examples, is that there must be an external source of something that's drawing down oxygen, right? If, if we had a perfect balance, um, then this would really net to zero roughly. Okay, so back out a little bit, and we can look at the entire Alviso complex, thank you, um, which is definitely dominated by DO consuming mechanisms, right? Because we have these really negative flux values and I was showing you values previously from this location. Um, and so what could this additional source of something that's drawing down oxygen be? Um, our hypothesis is that it's actually a function of what's happening in uh, pond A8. I'm going to give you that scenario in just a second. But I think that um, organic material is being, uh, well, first, there's lots of primary productivity in pond A8. And then oxygen and organic material are, are being exported throughout this um, Alviso complex uh, network. Now, another thing that could be going on that we haven't explored yet is the effect of stratification, which isn't really a source of um, additional DO demand, but it could really enhance the efficiency of benthic respiration in particular. So it could be it could be a factor, and also stratification is really fun. So I'm hoping that's important. Um, if we can put these things together, the supply and the demand for oxygen, for DO, then we'll look at these side by side, and then we can start um, gleaning a little bit more about how the system might be working. So you've seen all of these symbols before. They're exactly the same as they were previously. And what we're seeing is up here at the Dumbarton, we have a really narrow range of DO, and we also have a pretty modest um, consumption of DO happening there. Whereas down in this complex, and then in sort of an in-between uh, in these other slews, we have, in some cases, very high DO supplied in the blue bars, and then also really, really high demand for it um, in these locations. So it looks like the balance requires both of these things. We need to understand uh, condition or supply, which we're measuring directly, and then we need to understand the mechanisms that are drawing it down or sometimes increasing it. So this is just a, a really rough graphic of, of kind of what we think is happening here, um, which is we have really strong primary productivity inside pond A8, 
And then as it exchanges with Alviso slough on the tides through, through the notch right here, a controlled weir roughly right there, um, we have dissolved oxygen enriched water as well as organics being discharged to the slough system and sort of tidally dispersed throughout the sloughs in this area. And so um, both of these factors are really important in the balance for this region. Um, if you happen to notice Guadalupe, it's really kind of in rough shape here, uh, very low dissolved oxygen levels, high consumption. No time remaining. Well, that is excellent. Um, what are the implications for management, obviously? And, and a really important question, this is my last slide. Um, we're finding that we can start to understand mechanisms. Uh, we, we're really appreciating this robust data for that reason. Um, our next steps include ex exploring the effect of managing the exchange between Pond A8 and um, Alviso Slough through the data that we have, um, as well as then looking at um, physical and biogeochemical interactions within the sleuths. I think that's all I have. Yeah. So Lisa and Rusty just provided great overviews of two of our major priorities. One of them with Rusty, the, the state and transport of nutrients and being able to predict the cycling and phytoplankton production. Lissa with this really challenging issue of dissolved oxygen. Um, we have one other really major effort underway um, as part of this nutrient effort, and it's with phytoplankton that produce toxins, so harmful algae, which Jim alluded to in his presentation. And Lissa, please come back up, and we'll take questions from across the full range of topics. Of the light. Yeah. Really nice. Tom? Tom? Okay. Sorry, I got multiple questions, but I'll just do one for now. Let's say you just want to elaborate on you got my attention near the end as you, your, from your observations, you have some implications for management actions, but you didn't. You didn't touch what those actions are. You just say what you know, the relationship between the man, how the ponds are managed, and what you're observing. What should we? What should be do, managers be doing? Well, I don't know what managers should be doing quite yet, but the actions that I was referring to were um, controlling flow in and out of these managed ponds, the ponds that are subtidal and don't fully exchange um, with the bay on each tidal cycle. Um, they're really nice breeding grounds for algae and phyto phytoplankton and um, whether the flow is restricted or enhanced um, could potentially make a big difference, but I'm not sure which way it would tip the balance. So that's what I'm going to explore the data so now, for okay, next. So, yeah. yeah, thanks. Just going to follow up on that, because if you can maybe be clear about the data that you had, is that before? Because I know we have, we've been opening more and more notches. Yeah, yeah. So is the data you have linked um, to when all the notches were open or only a few of them? Uh, it spans a few configurations of, of the sort of gates within the notch, if there I'm eight, using the yeah, language correctly. Um, and I, yeah, there are eight total, and they're all fully open now. Um, and I think our data go back uh, over scenarios where there were five, three, and a brief period where it was fully closed. Hi. Hi, I'm Ellen Jock. Two of my favorite thinkers preceded me. <laughs> I'm uh, gr glad to be here to celebrate the 25th anniversary. I'm a member of the heritage class of r and <laughs> and founder. Um, my moniker is the Mud Lady. Most people know me about that because I'm interested in moving a whole lot of clean sediment from our bay's navigation channels to beneficial reuses, such as wetland restoration and levee rehabilitation, particularly in the South Bay. So. Just throwing this out here uh, to you, Lisa, because here again, management actions. <laughs> what if we took, which is on the discussion board, somewhere between five and seven million cubic yards of clean sediment from Redwood Harbor, Port of Oakland, maybe, maybe Richmond, took it over to Eden Landing, and then through a booster system, distributed it down into the South Bay salt ponds. Particularly the Alviso complex. 
And that is under discussion because that amount of sediment is needed for restoration and climate change. So just for DO purposes, you know, there, there will be reports on this at some point uh, waiting for those. But uh, what do you think would happen? What should we be watching out for in DO? So I can't. I can't be totally definitive, of course. No, right. Of course That's how every scientist is going to answer. But, uh, you're, you're here. Yeah. What studies? Yeah. Uh, you're fantastic. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think that generally the ponds that are fully exchanging with the tides, that are fully intertidal, like the island ponds, they're not showing the same um, really extreme fluctuation in DO, um, and they're not showing the same really consumptive environment as the Alviso complex. So I think that that potentially could kind of even out um, some of this really strong demand. But what it's also going to do, um, let's say you filled up, you know, the A8 complex so that it's no longer subtitle, um, and it, it could potentially cut off a really large source of dissolved oxygen too, um, in addition to the decaying organic matter that's circulating through the system. So um, my, my gut sense is that fully intertidal is better from a DO perspective. Um, but I, I'm not 100% sure of that. Okay, so, so management actions, obviously, you could, you look at how, how, how that's all going to be in years. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. Yes? First of all, a question for Rusty. Could you answer the question? Is it the house of cards or crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say we're at that stage of taking all those cards and sort of gluing them to each other to make a really good house of cards. <laughs> Thanks. And then for Morgane, um, so are you probably familiar with the work of Melissa Miller and others um, documenting uh, several dozens of California sea otters that have been killed by microcystin? in Monterey Bay area. Yes. Is this so, the one that were linked to the Pinto Lake? Well, uh, well who knows whether it's Pinto Lake. Tentatively. Yeah, who knows whether it's Pinto Lake. So it's, they're getting into the oceans, that's pretty clear, and they're impairing beneficial uses. So it's, it's a serious problem. Yeah, and that was another you know, big point I wanted to make on that last slide that I was rushing a bit through, is, is that it is, it's really important that our monitoring data is showing microsystems persisting to the point, if, if it's a freshwater toxin, they're still in the bay, and they're undoubtedly going out in the ocean. And nobody tests um, along the coast for the microsystems, but yet we're starting to see effects like those otters. So, right. yeah. Any other questions? I think. So back to the DO question. Um, it's really interesting to me that you um, were seeing the elevated the oxygen concentrations, but really high respiration. Um, but we're not observing hypoxia or impacts in the far south bay, like right. reaching. So, you have a crystal ball on that. Like, what what is going on? Why why aren't we seeing some of the impacts? Or could we be pushing the system with all of our restoration to have a much greater risk of those impacts? Are there management considerations there? Um, so I, I don't actually know what qualifies as hypoxia. Um, I think that Guadalupe, look, sorry? Uh, that, I've definitely heard that, yeah. I've, what's relevant to species or whatever, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and Guadalupe gets down there. Um, it's, I would say it's kind of in rough shape. So I'm not sure that we're not seeing impacts. As far as like extensive fish kills, I think that the DO that is produced inside of pond A8 is helping offset uh, that really strong consumption. <coughs> that's, that's my hypothesis. You, but you look skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and that's, kind of, that's what I was hoping to touch on with this. Well, I definitely think that we need to be considering um, what restoration activities are going to do. And um, what I'm hoping to look at next is understand what, you know, how adjusting that exchange between the pond and the clues is impacting 
you know, condition within the flu. So then that could help inform evaluating those restoration activities. So um, can I answer Jesse a little bit? Do you mind? <laughs> Please. <laughs> yes, um, I also had a question, but and great presentations from all of you. Um, I would say to Jesse that that's one of the pushes, and if Robert Schliff was here, he could probably respond a little more specifically about how we're looking at DO, but um, I would say that we are on the, um, for, in terms of restoration in the South Bay salt ponds, we've always been looking at how we can get the maximum of tidal marsh restoration and move away from managed ponds because we know they are so problematic from a water quality perspective. So this is our push to try to get as much tidal marsh as we can, but also acknowledging that we might need some managed ponds for some bird species and otherwise wouldn't have a, have a good habitat. So that's how we're managing it, is pushing along that, the uh, stairwell to get to a staircase that they put forward to get to more tidal marsh restoration. But um, my question was to Morgane, and that is um, appreciated that you're doing all the analysis on the, on the toxins, which is great. Um, one thing you talked about was uh, sort of looking as to see whether or not we're having that connection between Drake's Bay and our bay. And I'm wondering, we've talked about this before, about also looking in the other direction. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. We also are concerned about whether nutrients that are coming out of the bay and moving up the coast could also be having an impact on Drake's Bay. So just keep that in your mind and help with that analysis. That would be great. Yeah, that's definitely been very much on my mind. And I, I'm new to this specific area of, of, of interest. So I'm, I'm I found that area is retentive, right? It's a very reten it's a re relatively retentive area on the coast, which to me suggests that it absolutely could be impacted by nutrients. So if we're that Drake's Bay, actually, if you look at the last five years of stack testing data, um, there's maybe three years or something. There's there's huge, huge stack testing that's happening in that spot repeatedly, and you know that's that's a very interesting question to ask. Is is it is it happening more here, or is it or is it the same as the rest of the coast? But yeah, could it have anything to do with the high nutrients that are coming out of the bay and probably maybe hanging around in that area? Maybe it's a good thing we don't have an oyster fishery in there anymore. Is there any evidence that the uh, salt ponds and the sloughs are a source of harmful algal blooms to the bay? That's something we're strongly considering and very interested in. Because they're a more quiet, you know, the more quiescent area that we ever, you know, we know lots of phytoplankton blooms are happening there. There's a paper that Jim's group put out a while back saying they did find some harmful algal, some species or some genuses known to form harmful algal blooms in those salt ponds. So I would say yes, it's a definite possibility and it's something that we're interested in. We're really interested in any parts of the bay that seem more conducive to where phytoplankton will grow as being incubator, possible incubators for all algae, including harmful ones. So yes, the salt ponds are definitely of interest. I'd like to know what talk, if there's any toxins in them would be one interesting thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well I guess I'm gonna ask two questions. One for you, Margate, and one for Rusty. So, so, uh, so for you, Margate, it has to do with your, your observations about the microsystem, the freshwater toxin, and that but we know that we have them in our local reservoirs. We have harbor algal blooms. But your observations that they're happening, you're observing the highest levels at times where they wouldn't be seeing water coming from those those reservoirs is confounding. And so it, it, some implication is how are these things staying in salt water? So you're we don't know the answer, right? But it's not there's not there may be a link. There probably is probably a link to these local sources, but why are they not in sync time during the the algorithms in those reservoirs, they're not discharging. So they don't discharge at all in the summer? I don't know. That's they, the generally I they don't in the summer because they hold on to all the water. Because that's what I wanted to look into. I know that like there's all this monitoring of freshwater systems, but I was going to try to see if we could, and I know this race group is going to be looking at this too, trying to ask the question, which small inputs into the South Bay might be having microsystem coming down, but I didn't really realize the flows would be that low in the summer, but it is. Yeah. And I know we may have some insight to this, too. but the other part is just make it maybe confirmed that what I've heard at one of our nutrient management strategies during committee meetings when we were talking about the presence of microsystem and, and observations nationally, and perhaps it was Rafe who was pointing out observations in California are significantly higher than than most anywhere else. Is that observations of what microsystem in 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 waters in in California? Not necessarily in marine the water. water system. Yeah, but the fact that there's so much, so much more of them, may that have a, 
an implication on their their growing their their ability to evolve into uh, yeah, or their ability to in, in saltwater systems because there's a sure. lot more of them here than elsewhere apparently. Sure, or their ability to persist. So if you have a really high, high, high concentration in a reservoir, even if that reservoir is trickling in, maybe if it's a constant trickle, the microsystem itself is very persistent. So even if the cell dies and releases it, it still hangs around a while, and that's why it's able to be affecting the marine environment as well. So I wonder if even there's, like a small trickle, if it's a large one. enough concentration, is right. enough. that's there's, you know kind of question for you know, going along those lines, or, or is there potential for anything in the bay to be producing it? We don't really know. We don't have any evidence to suggest there is. But um, other estuaries have, you know, there have been other um, instances of microsystem and other estuaries being produced in it rather than outside of it. But yes, that right now the leading contender is the freshwater reservoirs that drain into the bay. And then, Rusty, you know, I'm maybe getting a little bit into the weeds, but I was just reflecting on your initial slides about showing the the improved performance of the, you know, the, the the new platform, but it's still not perfect. And then, but then on a grow, on a large uh, on a very wide scale, it looks pretty good, whether whether it be uh, uh, simulating velocity or salinity. But the issue is where you know do we you know the fact that it's better, but there's still there's still some anomalies. Do we get do we start do you guys start teasing out why we are not? Um, are there still those discrepancies, and are are there potential theories that are like are they important, and they might be important, and we go to local or smaller scales? Yeah, so some of those discrepancies we can sort of look at it and try to you know apply what we know about the flows and dispersion patterns and so forth. And uh, for instance, in that first velocity plot, like I have a good understanding of why did the old models not do well, and it's you know, it's related to you know, too much numerical diffusion between velocities and channels and adjacent shoals. And so that, to me, is something that's important because the difference in water quality parameters in the channel and between the shoal and farther reaches of the shoals, we, we know there's some important gradients there. And so that's the sign that says we're blurring those gradients too much in the model. And so... Some things are in that category where I can look at it and kind of try to backtrack and say, like, this is worth fixing. Other things, yeah, like when I look at, yeah, the, the velocity plot in the new model, it's a little straight, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. And I just have to say, that looks pretty good. <laughs> and, like, there's no screaming, like, you are messing this up for this reason. And we have to kind of call it a day on that. Uh, and similarly with the, the salinity stuff, yeah, we look at like pretty specific, yeah, we got the overall distribution pretty good. Did we get the stratification reasonable? Uh, but if X2 is off by a few kilometers, you know, that's, that doesn't for us necessarily like have a direct, like, oh, we better nail that. So it's, it's kind of picking and choosing and trying to, to pick things based on what seems important. To, to represent the uh, the processes that we build up in the biogeochemistry. Yeah, well, I love your answer because it gets it, it question is like a, what might be going on that could be consequential, or perhaps there's not a consequence to those those minor discrepancies, and that's what you need to think about logically, or that what what's going on with the physics or something that could be fixed. And good answer, but a good answer. Uh, keep thinking. <laughs> <laughs> 